Just who were the Romans? Talk number three of a series of a planned series of nine. I've entitled this one Taking Over a Country. A uh, little bit of revision. Uh, the first one was about taking over the past, how the Romans, what's the word, mined the past to find stories to produce an account of how they began. The second one is about taking over a hill. Rome, as you know, was built on seven hills and they had to start somewhere, so they started with hill number one. Now this is about how they took over not only all seven, but how they then took over the rest of the Italian peninsula, not the very northern part above the Po Valley, but the Italian peninsula. This strand ran for the best part of 500 years, from the 8th century to the 3rd century, give or take a few decades, obviously. They used the river and the hill for their security, for their water, for their communications. Uh, later on, they were able to levy, levy tolls on the trade that passed up and down the river, which of course made them richer and made them stronger. They used the river for everything. Remember what the water rat said about his river. Brother and sister to me and food and drink and aunts and company and naturally washing. Well, I don't know how often the Romans washed, but they certainly used the river for all sorts of reasons. It was the vital lifeblood of the city. As they went along, of course, it wasn't all plain sailing. There were rivals. They nobody well necessarily welcomed them. Not everybody was pleased to see them. They had struggles. They had obstacles to overcome. They had threats. They had troubles. They were sacked at least once. So they had their ups and downs. Uh, it's not a good idea, I think, to give you the names of all the tribes and all the peoples they fought, even if I could remember them all, and the chances are you won't remember them either. So I've kept the names down to a minimum of two. One, you need to know about the Etruscans. They lived halfway down Italy on the left-hand side as you look at it, halfway down on the right-hand side if you were coming down Italy from the Alps. The Etruscans had got there first, they had their own civilization, their own culture, and they were a very, very tricky proposition altogether. It is even suggested that for a while the Etruscans ran Rome. Rome was overcome by the Etruscans. I don't know whether, but I'm absolutely sure. Rome had seven kings, and it is suggested that the last three or four were in fact Etruscans. I don't know whether we shall know for sure. The other uh, group of people whom they came across were called, somewhat surprisingly, the Latins. And it is obvious, of course, that that's where the name of their language came from. Um, did the Latins uh, give them their language? Or was it by some curious chemistry of language, uh, the Romans adopted the name of this other neighbour tribe uh, and called it uh, used it to, to name their own language. I don't know. Was it their own homegrown or did they pinch it from the Latins? Anyway, the Latins were there. Geography played a big part in the history of the Rome because, as I was at pains to point out, uh, Italy contains an awful lot of mountain. And therefore, by uh, equal definition, it contains an awful lot of valleys. And incidentally, it contained quite a lot of volcanoes too. I don't know how active they all are these days. Uh, one or two, I think, still uh, might surprise you. So one way or another, it wasn't easy. <clears throat> so for the first three or four hundred years, it was quite heavy going. I suppose the safest thing to say is that they had more successes than they did failures. They must have been. They wouldn't have gone on to be so successful afterwards. If they'd had more failures, they'd have faded out of history altogether. So with success and growth came wealth and a greater population. They gradually took over one hill after another, built walls round it, until in the end they controlled all seven. Here is your party piece. Remember, Capitoline, Palatine, Aventine, Quirinal, Viminal, Caelian and Esquiline. Show that off at a party and everybody will take notice, you hope. 
the seven hills. All right. So by natural evolution, uh, they had to deal with all the neighbors they came across and they had to find a way of, um, in effect, defeating them, I suppose. Otherwise, they would again have disappeared from history. Uh, it's also worth noting that the Romans, by living near a river, uh, by being mainly farmers, they were lowland people and Italy had lots of mountains. So lowland people and highland people don't, as a rule, get on very well together. Uh, it's the lowlanders who work hard and produce all the food, the highlanders who live in a, in a rough area and make do with cattle or cattle stealing. And they are very fond of raiding the lowland countries from time to time because they're short of what they need. Uh, think of lowland Scotland and highland Scotland. Uh, the, um, the history of Scotland uh, has a lot to do with lowlanders versus highlanders. For example, when Bonnie Prince Charlie invaded England, the Highlanders were with him, but he had a lot of lowland Scots against him. Not all Scotland turned out for Bonnie Prince Charlie. And that brings up the name of another uh, tribe of people the Romans had to deal with quite a lot, actually, a group called the Samnites. I'll spell it S-A-M-N-I-T-E-S, -E the Samnites. In fact, the Romans thought fought three wars against the Samnites before they finally, not exactly polished them off, but were able to regard them as, as um, not quite such a threat as they had been. And further north, uh, somewhat of a surprise, were the Gauls. Now, most of you know that the Gauls lived in Gaul. In other words, what is modern day France? But there was quite a large lump of them on the other side of the Alps, on this side of the Alps. Um, and they stayed there uh, until Rome conquered them and controlled the whole of Italy right up to the Alps. But for a long, long time, three, four hundred years of their history, uh, when they talked about Italy, the Romans meant that they controlled just the, the leg part. They didn't control the, if you like, the pelvis part of Italy. That was independent, run by the Gauls. In fact, the Romans had two names. You'll come across this more than once in the history of Rome. Uh, the Gauls on the other side of the Alps, but it was called Transalpine Gaul, Trans, the Italian, uh, the, the Latin, sorry, uh, across on the other side of. And the part of Gaul that was on the southern side of the Alps was known as Cisalpine Gaul, C-I-S, Cisalpine Gaul, which means on this side, Transalpine Gaul and Cisalpine Gaul. You'll come across them again. But the Romans, as I said, were successful. They proved rather good at fighting, largely, I think, because they were very good at organizing. They discovered a trick, or they found they had a trick, for, for running things, well, for organizing things. Well, and later on, of course, for government, organizing whole countries and whole people. Uh, they developed a great sense of loyalty to the system. They very soon grew uh, a, a very strong air of conservatism, if you like, like most hard-working, not terribly rich farming people. Um, they were pretty conservative, pretty, they liked tradition. Uh, they were very difficult to move. Uh, they developed vast funds of, of stubbornness and resistance and resilience. It took an awful lot to get a Roman down, I tell you. Uh, and when the Romans dug their feet in, um, then you'd better watch out. One Greek historian said, um, the Romans are at the most dangerous when they feel threatened. So don't threaten the Romans, as you might be in trouble. Um, <clears throat> they developed a um, fearsome sense of discipline, obviously, uh, to, to tie in with all the other things that I've been talking about. Uh, this discipline <clears throat> went not only discipline regarding the state, and the local city and everything else, it went right down to the family. Or to turn it the other way around, discipline, like charity, began at home. The, the, the Roman head of the family, the pater familias, was a man with enormous power, power of life and death. And that, that tradition of discipline went right up 
to loyalty to the state as well, whether it was a city or a country or an empire. They proved very good at politics as well, as it turned out. As you know, to begin with, they had seven kings. Uh, <clears throat> the last one uh, was a bit of a bad lot. We are led to believe that um, Tarquinius uh, could well have been an Etruscan. Uh, that might have been why he got such a bad press. I don't know. But anyway, whether they were Etruscan or not, by the time of Tarquinius, who uh, made himself very unpopular, he was apparently a uh, uh, a man with a great sense of his own honour and dignity. The Romans called him Tarquinius Superbus, Tarquin the Proud, and he paid the price of pride. And once they got rid of Tarquinius, they decided that was enough. They were up to here with kings, and they weren't going to have any more. Which is why, so we are told, hundreds of years later, Julius Caesar got himself murdered because it was believed by many people that he planned to make himself the king of Rome. So from about 500 BC, when they kicked out the kings, uh, to when the empire began was 500 years. So the empire was a long time coming. There was no Roman empire as we understand it you know, with, with the chariots and the, and the Christians in the arena and all the rest of it. It was a republic. Uh, one of the reasons it didn't develop very far towards an empire was that it had a lot of its own internal troubles, uh, chiefly uh, social ones, actually. Uh, it resolved itself into a pretty long battle, intermittently, for quite a few hundred years between though what between the ones on the top and the ones on the bottom to put it as simply as possible the ones on the top were the ones were, who got in first the founder members the ones who took all the risks did all the early hard work established themselves and they became known as the patricians it's a latin word of course the top people the aristocrats the posh ones the ones who ran everything the patricians and so by definition everybody else were the ordinary people, and the Romans had a name for them too, the plebeians. The Roman, uh, the Roman word, or the Latin word, plebs, simply means the people. So for two or three hundred years, there was a constant running battle between the patricians and the plebeians. For example, um, at one time, the plebeians got f so fed up with the way the patricians were pushing them around, they went on strike. So the patricians discovered that um, all the people who did all the humdrum menial jobs weren't going to do it. So they had to come, if not to heal, they had to come to the conference table, as it were, and work out some kind of compromise. That took shape um, in, uh, in politics. After they kicked out the kings, the Romans decided that having one man at the top of the state was dangerous. So they decided in future to have two, and they were to be elected every year. And they were called consuls, consuls. And the patricians, of course, monopolized the elections, but part of the battle consisted of the plebeians at last winning the right to insist, and it was written into the Roman Republican constitution that henceforth, at least one of the two consuls would be a plebeian. Doesn't mean that all plebeians were poor, by the way. They weren't all downtrodden serfs. Well, a lot of plebeians were quite well off, but they were not patrician, you see. They didn't have the blue blood tradition. Anyway, from, I forget the exact date, but after two or three hundred years, the plebeians won the right to have at least one consul as a plebeian, sometimes both. Um, but that took up a lot of Rome's early energy, their early internal energy. But the knack for government persisted and it grew. And as the Romans resolved various disputes with their trading neighbours and with their geographical neighbours, um, that knack for government served them very well. Because, all right, they won a lot of victories. They, they defeated them in the end. But they didn't defeat them by, by 
overrunning them and exploiting them and grinding their faces into the ground. No. They produced a system whereby <clears throat> whichever city or little group the Romans overcame, uh, they set up a separate partnership is not the right word, quite the right word, but it, it amounted to a partnership, but a partnership in which the Romans were always the senior partner. It was quite clearly understood. Uh, the city that was incorporated into the Roman Empire, dare I say it yet, um, were allowed to run their own show except for foreign policy and defence. The Romans called the shots there. The Romans, as I said, were the senior partners. So it was incorporation rather than exploitation. There were no grinding tributes of taxes which left all the people in the subordinate city uh, desperate paupers, no. The Romans weren't softies, far from it. But they did appreciate that cities appreciated themselves doing their own thing, running their own show. And it seemed to work because the cities and the tribes and the various peoples whom the Romans conquered in that four or five hundred years from eight hundred from the eighth century to the third century they appeared to be reasonably content with it uh, uh, perhaps if, what, what if they sat down and um sort of did a balance sheet they worked out that the the perks beat the snags it wasn't all wonderful no not everybody liked the romans they weren't a very likable people but they were efficient and things they did worked and as I said, the perks outnumbered the snags. So these other cities, over time, one after the other, accepted what the Romans called the Republic, or what the Romans called the Res Publica. The Latin word res, R-E-S, simply means thing, matter, subject, topic, race. Publica, self-explanatory, we get our word public from it, obviously. So the res publica, was simply the, the government thing, the public thing. That's what the Romans did, and they were good at it. And we've got our word, obviously, republic from it. So that went on quite nicely until the Romans found that they had spread to the southern part of Italy, the heel and the toe of Italy. They controlled pretty well the rest by now, apart, as I said, from the area in the far north, which they called Cisalpine Gaul. What was in the south, what was in the heel and the toe? A new problem, a new group of people, namely the Greeks. Uh, what on earth were the Greeks doing there? The Greeks were trading and making a great deal of money because the southern part of Italy had lots of very convenient harbours. Uh, these harbours were close to Greece and the Greeks were, if nothing else, great colonists, great traders and great travellers. We tend to think of the Greeks uh, in a particular way because of the way we were taught about them at school. Uh, and we get the impression that uh, nine Greeks out of ten were philosophers and scientists and intellectuals and Olympic athletes and, and quite brainy and, uh, and, you know, pretty jolly superior. Well, they were great traders as well. They were great capitalists, they were great money makers, they were great travellers, and they were great colonists. And they had colonies all around the coast of southern Italy. And not only that, I mean, they, they went everywhere else. As well. They founded Marseille, for example. They had colonies on the, on the coast of the Black Sea. They had colonies in North Africa. They had colonies in southern Spain. They went everywhere did the Greeks. Anyway, the Romans ran up against the Greeks. And without going into detail, it finished up with the Romans fighting a war against the Greek cities. Uh, the Greek cities decided that they better call in a powerful ally. Uh, and just across the sea, across the Adriatic Sea in northern Greece, uh, was a convenient champion to come and help sort them out. <clears throat> he lived in a country called Epirus, E-P-I-R-U-S, Epirus. It's very roughly where Albania is now. <clears throat> anyway, this man was called Pyrrhus. I've got to spell it again. P-Y-R-R-H-U-S, Pyrrhus. <clears throat> and Pyrrhus, being a very successful warrior, 
was on the lookout for more fields in which to win honour, glory, money and possibly territory as well. So the Greek cities called him in. They wanted a champion. Pyrrhus wanted some fresh exploits to boast about. And so the Romans fought the first war which took them beyond the boundaries of their country, known as the Pyrrhic War. And they won. Took them 10 years, and Pyrrhus, who invaded Italy and won several victories, but one of them particularly was so costly, the casualty rate amongst Pyrrhus's army was so large that Pyrrhus is supposed to have come out with the famous remark, one more victory like this, and I'm finished. And it went not only into the history books, it went into folklore, and it's gone into the dictionary. A Pyrrhic victory is a victory which is so costly, it's as bad as a defeat. Anyway, Pyrrhus was defeated. He went off fighting somewhere else, and in the course of doing some uh, attacking and looting in a city, a tile was blown off the roof or fell off the roof, might even have been thrown off the roof. It was a very lucky shot because it hit him on the head and killed him. So Pyrrhus was finished, the Pyrrhic War was over, the Greek cities in southern Italy had to accept the inevitable and give in and sign similar treaties to the ones signed by all the other Italian cities, which incorporated them into Rome and made them each the junior partner in this series of um, political partnerships. So the Romans now controlled the whole of the Italian leg, if you like. They still didn't control Cisalpine Gaul. How had they done it? One of the ways uh, the Romans might even invent it, well, they certainly invented the phrase divide et impera. Latin, of course. Uh, divide, divide, and impera. Impera means to rule. An emperor was somebody who ruled. An imperator was a man who ruled an army, a general. So it's, it's Latin through and through. They played off one city against another. They played off one group of people against another. Plus, of course, straight fighting and straight winning. One of their advantages, I think, as I said, being a lowland people, they had more resources. They had a, a more solid, I want to say respectable, more solid, reliable sort of life. Mountain peoples uh, could be very fierce and very violent and at times very successful. But the general verdict of military historians is that they didn't have a great deal of discipline and staying power. Whereas the Romans did, one of their trump cards was staying power. They couldn't half put their heads down and stick it out. And there were many tribal feuds which divided these peoples as much as anything else. But the Romans were a much more homogeneous lot. They stuck together so much more. So the Romans grew, as I said, with success, with money, with prosperity. They grew in numbers, and they grew in manpower. One of their great strengths that they showed in years to come was that they were never short of armies. However many armies they got defeated, uh, they could always somehow collect some more. They could dredge up some more. One of the great enemies of Rome, Hannibal, was always mystified by the fact that no matter how many times he crushed a Roman army within an unbelievably short time, they'd cobble together another one. And they put that in the field too, and it just went on and on. Uh, I repeat, the Romans had this trick which they developed for government. Uh, the people they defeated didn't become conquered, cowed, crushed, enslaved peoples. Many of them became allies. And that, again, made a more homogeneous unit. It made them stick together that much more. As I said, they were allowed home, home rule. Cities could run their own show. They had their own town council. But in foreign policy, uh, the Romans called the shots. Each city had a separate treaty with Rome. <clears throat> the Romans also surprised the world, maybe slightly themselves. Everybody wants to win, and when you do, uh, it's very nice. 
Uh, but once you've won, uh, you wake up to an uncomfortable truth that winning is not the end. It's the beginning. Gaining an empire, conquering an empire, getting hold of an empire, stealing an empire is one thing. Running it, making it work is another. And that's what the Romans were good at. Uh, they turned out to be very, very good at running an empire. Now, I've got to be careful about the word empire. Uh, at the moment, I'm talking about a group of territories <coughs> run by a single, in this case, city government. So it seems fair, <coughs> excuse me, to call it an empire. Now, by that, I don't mean the Roman Empire that people talk about when they think of gladiators and chariot races in the Circus Maximus and so on. I mean, an empire with a small e and the empire with a capital E. At the moment, all they had was a small e empire. Pretty large, though, but still a small e empire. But in 500 years, they had gone from being humble shepherd farmers like everybody else <coughs> on a riverside hill. They had gone on to become the master of the whole of peninsula Italy. Not bad going. They had become a power. They joined the big league. They were in the top team. They were the top people again with everybody else, all the other top people. They're a bit rough around the edges. Some of the more uh, sophisticated, civilized, if you like, genteel uh, countries of the eastern Mediterranean were to discover that they thought the Romans were a bit of a set of rough diamonds. But my word, they were efficient. And the great thing was they were now in. They were ha People had to recognize the Romans as a major power. They were in the club and they were now ready to play a bigger game. But I finish by saying that we can talk about an empire, but it's still an empire with a small e. The, the cliche empire that everybody knows with a capital E had not come run yet. We hadn't got as far as the chariot races and the evil emperors.